Welcome to Jackson Lewis's podcast, We Get Work. Focused solely on workplace issues, it is our job to help employers develop proactive strategies, strong policies, and business-oriented solutions to cultivate an engaged, stable, and inclusive workforce. Our podcast identifies issues that influence and impact the workplace and its continuing evolution and helps answer the question on every employer's mind, how will my business be impacted? Avoiding workplace hazards in the construction industry may be next to impossible, but it's critical to ensure the health and safety of employees, as well as maintaining compliance with potentially dangerous OSHA regulations. On this episode of We Get Work, we discuss real life examples of what to do and what not to do when OSHA comes knocking at your door to assess your worksite safety hazards and accident prevention efforts. Our hosts today are Dion Kohler, a principal in the Atlanta office and co-leader of the firm's construction group, Courtney Malvo, a principal in the Richmond office and co-leader of the Workplace Safety and Health Group, and Sean Paisan, of counsel in the Orange County office of Jackson Lewis and leader of the firm's Cal OSHA subgroup and co-leader of the firm's construction group. Dion's practice is broad in scope and includes traditional labor matters involving labor organizations, as well as the defense of employment litigation and administrative charges. Dion is also recognized for his experience and counsel in matters relating to occupational safety and health, affirmative action, employment contracts, and wage and hour matters, including prevailing wage laws. Courtney, no stranger to regulatory action, enforced federal and state OSHA laws as Virginia's labor commissioner before joining Jackson Lewis. Sean assists employers with all workplace safety matters, from compliance to investigations and inspections, to the appeals of citations in California, Arizona, Washington, and Hawaii, and is knowledgeable on the myriad of Cal OSHA regulations imposed on businesses, especially in the construction, manufacturing, and healthcare industries, and the consequences for violations of those regulations. Dion, Courtney, and Sean, the question on everyone's mind today is, what strategies should construction employers use when the OSHA inspector shows up at their work site, and how does that impact my business? Well, thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, today, we're going to answer some of the most common questions we get from our construction clients about OSHA inspections and provide you with some tips and advice regarding minimizing your liability and how to respond. Uh, let's start off by talking about when OSHA shows up. Should we allow the inspection to continue? Should we require a warrant or should we do something else? Courtney, why don't you help us with that? Sure, and uh, thanks, Dion. And I'll tell you one thing I always counsel people is act with intent. Don't just react to whatever's thrown your way. Having a game plan and knowing how you're going to handle the inspection before it starts is really important. So example, what you're talking about. So should we consent to a search or should we require a warrant? Now, you can require a warrant. You most certainly can. Do you want to? And I will tell you, most of the time, my answer is no, because they're going to get a warrant anyway. And then, and I, 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 I've been inside the agency. I've done these inspections on behalf of the agency, soup to nuts. I kind of know their mindset. And they'll tell you, um, if you turn them around, make them go get a warrant, go through that process, then come back, it changes the tenor of the inspection. And so um, they may start to draw some inferences against you. They may start digging in a little bit more. They may try to push uh, to uh, topics that um, they want to inspect you for and kind of push the limits on that. And so um, I like an inspection that is um, one that is professional, uh, the tone, everyone's calm, and uh, we step with intent. Um, we're uh, being cooperative, but not necessarily giving away the farm. So you can require it. I, I just don't think it's always a good idea. Sean, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, thanks, Courtney. So, you know, in terms of consenting, I just had a few comments. When OSHA shows up, they conduct, they conduct the opening conference and they sort of 
or they should lay out the scope of what they intend to inspect. And, uh, you know, at that point, the employer has the option to consent to that. Or, you know, if you force OSHA to go get a warrant, they're going to usually go get a wall-to-wall warrant. Whereas if you're consenting, it's usually limited in scope to a specific item that they're there to inspect. Um, Another thing about consent is that just because you're consenting to the inspection of that item doesn't mean that you can't revoke the consent or discuss the scope of your consent later on should the inspector um, go beyond what was originally discussed uh, during the uh, opening conference. All right, let's move on to the next question that I have, and that is, how does OSHA decide who they're going to inspect on any given day? Sean, why don't you help us with that? Sounds good, Dion. So, you know, there there are a number of ways that OSHA inspections usually get started. Um, Most commonly is if there is a serious accident or serious injury and you're reporting that into OSHA, more likely than not, they're going to show up and conduct an inspection. Other ways that inspections can get started are programmed inspections um, for specific Industries, construction may be included in one of those, especially if there is a an emphasis uh, program in place uh, for certain uh, uh, hazards. Um, and then also, um, if an inspector just happens to be driving by the site and see something occurring, um, they could stop at the uh, site and start an inspection there. You know, I, I will tell you, and um, it's a little even more specific to construction. Um, this is how it kind of goes down with OSHA, and I I've been on these. I know. And so, literally, they will stake out sometimes uh, – construction sites are out in the open, and sometimes there are some visual barriers here or there, but they'll find high ground or they'll find a place. And uh, it, it could be like a lion in the Serengeti just waiting in the tall grass and uh, with the camera, the video, everything, and and they'll just wait. I, I've, I've been out there for a couple hours, and, and what happens in a couple hours – at a site. Okay, you get up in the morning, you do the job hazard analysis, you make sure you do your toolbox talks, you make sure everybody's on point. Great. Sure enough, I've seen it. An hour in, hour and a half in, people are hot. People get bored. Um, they kind of go on autopilot with their brain, and the mistakes start to happen. And they start stepping on the top rung. I've seen it. They step on the top rung of that ladder when they know better. Um they don't necessarily put on their PPE as necessary or, uh, you know, any of a number of things. It's just how the human being seems to be built. And OSHA, especially with construction sites, not the same with manufacturing warehouses or some others where they don't have that kind of visual. And they'll sit and watch and wait for your guys to step out on ledges without fall protection. And it does happen. And they, by the time they cross the street or cross the field and come onto your site, they have the goods. That's how construction, unfortunately, works for OSHA. And so OSHA is very attuned to construction because that's about where half of injuries and illnesses tend to happen um, and more substantial ones occur. And so because they're out in the open and because that is uh, an industry that is higher hazard than many, um, they will actually kind of stake out and lay in wait and then come across the street and and they and they already have the evidence they need and so that's what you have to be ready for um so is, is it fair no not at all but um also a lot of construction sites they the inspector can see them en route while driving and will stop uh I, again i i i've been in an uh, in enforcement mode and i see Uh, excavation done incorrectly and whether that's uh, whether I'm quote unquote on the clock or not or uh, whether I'm supposed to be inspecting that area if I happen to see an excavation or fall protection or something else happening and I don't address it that's on me so there is a lot of um, there there there's a lot of exposure uh, just because you're you, you can be seen and inspectors when they get up and they go to work, some of them don't even make it into the office or where they say they're going to go. They may run into so many infractions at construction sites, they may never get around to that programmed inspection they were supposed to get to. Um, that's real, and that happens. So again, it's, is it fair? None of this is fair, but it is what it is, and so an inspector just can't drive by a site, see a hazard, and do nothing. And so 
you know, you may never have a programmed inspection like Sean mentioned. It may all be just what is seen in plain view by virtually a member of the public. Okay, I want to shift gears here and uh, flip it over to Sean. Uh, Sean, would you help us with telling us the different types of ocean inspections, how they're different, and what are the limits of an ocean inspection? Yeah, so as I may have mentioned earlier, um, there are uh, you know different triggers for ocean inspections. One could be a, a, a serious injury occurring. Uh, it could be programmed. Or as Courtney uh, was discussing earlier, it could just be the inspector driving by and seeing something. Um, so those are what we usually call in-person inspections. Um, there are also letter inspections where um, – Cal OSHA may receive, or not Cal OSHA, but any OSHA may receive a complaint. And out here in California, they'll send a, a letter to the to the employer um, with the complaint items. Um, at that point, the employer would respond in writing uh, to that letter complaint. And we we recommend uh, making sure that that response is pretty comprehensive, you know, without giving away the farm, of course, uh, because a letter inspection is is much more preferable to actually having an inspector come on site and, uh, you know, sort of digging around and finding things to cite for. So that that is the type of inspection that we want to make sure that our clients are um, responding to uh, in a comprehensive manner um, while not making any uh, key admissions that may come back to hurt them later. My follow-up question is, can you limit the scope of an OSHA investigation? And how should you handle that if the inspector just starts wandering around and uh, wants to look at things that weren't part of your original discussion? Or uh, how much freedom should you give the inspector when they're conducting the investigation? Great question, Dion. So uh, that all stems from the opening conference. And you want to make sure that you're paying attention during that opening conference because the inspector is obligated to set forth the scope of his or her inspection during that opening conference. And whatever you consent to is, you know, it, it's knowing consent. So at that point, the inspector tells you what he or she's going to inspect and you're either going to consent to that or not. If during the walk around, uh, um, the inspector wants to see things that w weren't in the scope of the inspection or just the scope of your consent, um, you can certainly bring that up with the inspector in a polite way, of course, and, you know, invite uh, some discussion about that. And the inspector could choose to have another opening conference where they uh, call into uh um, into the scope, the, the additional items. Of course, there's got to be some probable cause for them to do so. Um, but if the inspectors, you know, during that walk around, see something in plain view, um, you know, that's fair game. So it's very important um, that if you want to limit your inspection, that you're not, you know, sort of leading the inspector into areas that uh, would be fair game for them to uh, conduct the inspection on. Um, so, for 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 a construction site, for example, let's say you've got some trenching occurring on the on the north side of the property, but the um, the uh, inspector wants to inspect something on the south side of the property. Well, take the inspector directly to the south side of the property so that they're not seeing something that wasn't in the scope of the inspection to begin with. And to add on to what Sean said, I have to highlight, you know, while usually my practice is oftentimes to have a consent. Um, to an inspection, there are times when you do require a warrant. Now, if you do require a warrant, and sometimes it's it should be necessary, um, then you can actually develop in writing the limits to the scope of that inspection. And when Sean says probable cause, it's what that inspector has probable cause to believe is a hazard at that worksite based on what they observe or what might have been reported to OSHA before they came on site. And so if they have uh, a report of, uh, for example, failure to provide uh, personal fall arrest systems to employees, well, they should go to those employees who seem to be exposed to, per to uh, potential fall uh, hazards and then inspect their equipment and even ask about what, how it's provided and whether they're trained on, et cetera. But that doesn't mean they go running off, as Sean said, to another part of the site where um, fall protection is not required and start jumping into something else unless it happens to be in plain view. Um, and again, um, you know, think about, uh, well, think about, 
For example, if uh, a police officer was investigating your home or somewhere, then whatever's in plain view is fair game. So, uh, but except for that, uh, if you get the warrant, the, the you're actually requiring the agency to get wording into the warrant and into an affidavit attached to it, defining exactly what they're supposed to be looking for. No more, no less. And that's it. My next question deals with the interview of employees and managers. Should those be, how should those be handled and should they be handled differently by the employer? Absolutely. And I can't tell you. How many times I've been given a case where we have made admissions that um, provide evidence unnecessarily to the agency? Now, of course, we don't obstruct uh, inspections. We're very, we are truthful in our answers at all times, certainly. Um, we also don't necessarily need to lay out every sin possible uh, at that time. We're responsive. We're professional. Um, and, um, you know, just like a witness on the stand at trial, you speak, when you speak, you answer the question and you stop talking. Now, the difference between an, a manager and a non-manager is this. When a manager speaks, the manager is speaking on behalf of the company. And when a manager makes an admission, that's not just that one individual making an admission, it's the company. And that is extremely difficult to undo if a manager, um, reveals all sorts of hazards or violations that are occurring. So if an employee does, well, the employee might be, may misunderstand the hazards around him or her, or may not necessarily know the uh, engineering controls that have been put in place that they're not aware of. And so that's more easily corrected. But a manager uh, really has to be extremely careful about what they say. And also, they have a right not to be interviewed. So we may think strategically, okay, before we allow a manager to go, should we? go forward with that interview. And also, in all likelihood, that manager may want to have counsel uh, and other managers present for the interview, which is allowable, or otherwise they can decline. Uh, employees are more sacrosanct. There is a sacrosanct right for employees to be interviewed privately by an OSHA inspector. And so we respect that. We respect their right to be interviewed, and we respect their right not to be interviewed. But an important tip is this. Oftentimes, the inspector will write down their version of what they hear an employee say, and all this is happening behind closed doors, and you are on the opposite side of the door. And the inspector will write down these notes and then slide it across the table to the employee, hand the employee a pen and say, here, sign this. Employees don't have to sign anything, and they oftentimes think that they do. And OSHA gets a lot of written admissions from employees that, uh, from people who, and I've had nightmare scenarios where the employee couldn't read it because they don't speak, uh, English may not be their native language, or because they didn't have the reading glasses. And so uh, there are times when employees are asked um, with um, uh, some assertion to sign a statement, and, and the statement may not reflect accurately what the employee said. So the employees do have some rights, but making sure that we observe their right to either be interviewed or not in private with the inspector is tantamount. Sean, I have a follow-up for you. Does the employee have the right to a copy of any statement they may give, and do we have the right as the employer to advise the employee of their rights and to give them advice regarding that? Great question, Dion. And it's important to keep in mind and, and also remind the employees, because at least in my experience, uh, the inspectors out here in California do a pretty poor job of um, advising the employees of their rights. And as Courtney mentioned earlier, the employee holds the right to either consent to the interview, decline the interview, or perhaps consent to the interview with some sort of qualifications present, such as having, you know, maybe an attorney or someone from management present. Um, so, uh, you know, a lot of times the inspectors treat the employees um, uh, just basically as a given that they have to give these interviews or they have to sit for these interviews. Um, the employees, um, without that advice, won't know that they have the ability to decline those interviews. Now, of course, we always want to, you know, tell the employees that, you know, we're cooperating with a, an OSHA investigation. Um, they'd like to interview you. We'd like for you to cooperate. Um, but that's up to you whether or not you want to be interviewed or not. Um, and so, yeah, it's absolutely appropriate, at least in my opinion, to uh, let the employees know, you know, what, what uh, they 
can or cannot do in this situation. And also to let the employee know that we're not going to hold it against you one way or the other. If you want to speak with OSHA, that's up to you. If you don't, that's also up to you. Either way, we're good with it. Um, for managers, uh, the, the company holds the right to consent. The, the managers themselves um, often get tricked into consenting, but really, um, when when managers are asked to 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 be interviewed, um, they should be you know kicking up kicking that up the chain of command to perhaps the company's legal department or outside counsel to determine whether or not it's appropriate for that manager to be interviewed, um, whether or not that manager has the authority to consent to that interview. Because again, it's the company that holds the right to consent to that interview or not. And this goes back to what Courtney mentioned at the very outset of this program is to have a plan in place uh, before OSHA even comes on the property so that um, they can uh, advise these managers, hey, listen, if if OSHA ever comes on site, you guys don't have the authority to consent. You need to do this, this, and this before uh, even consenting to the inspection to begin with. So uh, I think having a plan in place, uh, this all comes back to that, just being prepared uh, is really the right way to go. Thank you. Uh, my next question is, based on your experience, and I know you both have years in, of experience in advising construction employers regarding OSHA inspections, what are the biggest mistakes you see employers make? And this plan you talked about, is that something like in the form of a checklist and training that employers should do for their project managers and superintendents so they are prepared and follow a process when an inspection occurs? I will say an act of omission is the greatest in addition to um, admissions made by managers, my second highest is failure to build a dummy file. So when OSHA inspects, they're gathering evidence, evidence they will use against you. And so and it will not provide you with its file unless and until you contest and you're in litigation. So you will go months without getting the information OSHA has. So when the inspector takes a picture, I like a two-person tandem following that inspector. I like one person focusing on the inspector, asking lots of open-ended questions, asking what they see. And by the way, OSHA inspectors want to tell you what they're seeing. They want to tell you, so let them. And the second person is getting all the evidence. When a picture is taken, they take the exact same picture, same angle. When they, the inspector takes a video, same video, same everything. You don't want to obstruct them, of course, but you have every right to accompany them and get all the information they're getting at the time. When they do interviews, make note of who they're interviewing um, without interfering. And, and I do so in the, in the context of being helpful to the inspector. Um, but while I'm being helpful, I'm also gathering information that's going to be helpful to our case. Now, one thing I've seen um, that uh, jumps out to me to answer your question, Dion, is reenacting accidents like um Let's say there is an accident on a site and the OSHA inspector, you know, is out there to investigate. And basically, sometimes the inspector will ask uh, the employer to put the employees in place and sort of reenact what they think occurred so that the OSHA inspector can take pictures of it. Um, I think that's a, a, a really dangerous thing to 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 take part in and uh, I, I usually recommend against that and so that'd be uh, one of the the biggest uh, issues uh, that employers should watch out for it doesn't happen a lot but be very careful if that if that comment or request ever comes your way thank you sean uh for our last question if you're an employer and you get a relatively small fine with a citation why shouldn't the employer just settle it, pay the money, and move on? Is uh, What are the kinds of factors and considerations an employer needs to take into account before they make that decision? Yeah, so uh, out here uh, in California, I was working on a case a while back uh, that involved a, uh, a roofing contractor or a roofing supply contractor. And... Um, they're responsible for delivering roofing materials to construction sites, uh, residential construction sites. And um, uh, you, you may have seen this if you're in the construction industry, but it's essentially a, a, a flatbed truck that has a conveyor system um, that delivers the, the roof, roofing materials directly to the top of the home that's under construction. Well, they got cited for not, someone fell off the, the back of the truck, of course, and they got cited for not having guardrails on their truck. Um, 
and it was only a couple hundred dollars. They were thinking about paying it, but as we looked more into it, um, it was clear that the abatement was going to be, uh, you know, in the six figures, if not more. Uh, and so, e even though you're dealing with a, a few hundred dollar citation, the abatement itself, the cost to fix whatever is being alleged, uh, could be much more magnitudes more and in our case you know after they contacted me we you know we did some research and we learned that um what the citation was based on wasn't even a, a violation to begin with um and so we were able to make the citation go away just by taking a little bit of a more uh detailed look at the citation itself and the regulation that was alleged to have been violated so uh you know it may be tempting to just go ahead and pay the fine um but uh you know Take a look at the the cost of abatement. That's that's certainly one thing that you want to consider. Courtney, are there any other issues in that regard that that um, would jump out to you? Specifically, Courtney, would you address the risk of repeat or willful violations based on an earlier settlement? Oh, absolutely. Especially you look at what is being cited. Is it being cited correctly? And is it something that's likely to repeat? So, for example, if you get cited for failure to provide training and you did train that employee, but the employee didn't get it. Um, you know, it's 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 one of those citations that is easily repeatable. So you might actually in negotiations, yes, negotiations with the agency during the informal conference or even afterward in litigation to have the standard cited or the facts that are depicted in the citation to fit what um, is more specific to that situation, but also less likely to land you in a repeat. And I can't tell you how many people think, oh, well, let's just do other than serious. We can't get a repeat on that. Answer is wrong. You can. It's not common, but it does happen. And so what you agree to in an, a final order can come back and hit you with a repeat with a penalty that could be 20, um, that could be 10 times higher. So that's that's something you really have to watch for. Hey, Courtney, your, your comment about the final order just reminded me um, another good reason to you know, appeal even a few hundred dollar citation may be to get a non-admissions clause in that final order um, so that the the citation and the fact that you settled can't be used in any ancillary proceedings. Um, you know, let's say it, it's a multi-employer site, of course, most, most construction sites are. Um, and, uh, you know, one of not your employees, but perhaps another subs employee was was injured as a result of something that you were cited for well getting that non-admissions clause may prevent that employee that other employee from coming back and trying to sue you civilly it won't prevent them from suing you civilly but you know your civil attorney will have a much better shot at uh, excluding that evidence through a motion to eliminate if you have that non-admissions clause in so uh, another good reason to you know appeal and to perhaps just settle out to get that non-admissions clause even if you even if the citation has merit well, thank you, Sean and Courtney. That's all very helpful and excellent advice. Of course, if you have any follow-up questions or would like any further information, feel free to reach out to Courtney or Sean. Thank you for joining us on We Get Work. Please tune into our next program where we will continue to tell you not only what's legal, but what is effective. We Get Work is available to stream and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Libsyn, Pandora, SoundCloud, Spotify, Stitcher, and YouTube. For more information on today's topic, our presenters, and other Jackson Lewis resources, visit jacksonlewis.com. As a reminder, this material is provided for informational purposes only. It is not intended to constitute legal advice, nor does it create a client-lawyer relationship between Jackson Lewis and any recipient.